All right, hello and welcome to Systematics and Phylogenetics. This lecture will have a little bit of uh, some basic features of eukaryotes, specifically regarding uh, endosymbiosis. Um, and then we will go into how we classify organisms, uh, classic taxonomic stuff, and then systematics. So. Uh, systematics uh, will include cladistics um, and some cool stuff in there. So uh, without further ado, uh, it is 12, 12 a.m. Let's talk about endosymbiotic theory. Okay, so approximately 2.1 billion years ago, right? Uh, Pro, uh, prokaryotes were the dominant life form and then we had the first appearance of eukaryotes. So what did this mean? Why did it, or what were eukaryotes? What fundamentally produces a eukaryote? Okay, so first off, let's talk about the nature of eukaryotic organelles. One of the features of eukaryotes is the presence of membrane-bound organelles that are specialized in order to do all the functions a cell requires to be alive uh, and do it efficiently enough to keep a very, very large cell alive. Now, most organelles were formed from involutions of the cell membrane. So the cell membrane sort of bent inwards, right? So we have little bits bending in uh, and then they form the various organelles. There are notably two exceptions, the mitochondria and the plastids. Plastids, uh, you can think chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are the plastids in plants. Um, plastid is a general term for a photosynthetic organelle. Now, why is this important to make this distinction? Uh, it goes like this. Um, green plants, right? They're the ones you know with all their chloroplasts, but protista. Uh, all the different subkingdoms of protestans uh, have dazzling variants. And there's a whole bunch of them that are photosynthetic. And so they have protestan plastids. Uh, and there's some very fascinating thing go th things going on. Okay, so what is endosymbiont theory? In case it's been a uh, half a minute and you've forgotten it from Bio 1, let's review real quick. So, first off, mitochondria and plastids were once free living prokaryotes. Right? They were once free living prokaryotes. They were absorbed by a proto eukaryote ancestor. Proto eukaryote, because this was before mitochondria and all eukaryotes have mitochondria. So if it was doing the absorbing in order to get a hold of uh, what would become the mitochondria, well, it's not a eukaryote yet. It's a big old cell with some organelles, but not a eukaryote. Okay, so it was absorbed by a proto-eukaryote ancestor. Now, um, essentially, for some reason, which we're not entirely sure. Uh, they were not 
digested. And thus, they entered into a symbiotic relationship. Became symbiotic. Uh, symbiotic as a word simply means organisms living together. There's a variety of different ways you can be symbiotic. Uh, you can be commensal. In commensalism, uh, basically one benefits, one is unaffected. So, one of them is getting a benefit to their symbiotic relationship, and one of them is not affected positively or negatively. Another symbiotic relationship is parasitic. A parasitic relationship. One benefits, one is harmed. Uh, and this brings us to the third option, the one that we saw uh, when mitochondria and plastids um, were not digested and instead became symbiotic. They entered into a mutualistic relationship. Mutualistic. Uh, both benefit. In this case, the mitochondria and plastids gained protection They gained food, right? So they were fed, they were protected, right? They no longer had to expend energy on navigating the environment. They were no longer worried about being free living, worried about, uh, which meant they did not have to seek out food, uh, you know, their internal environment was maintained. They were given an environment that was beneficial. Don't have to worry about desiccating or the temperature going bad. Uh, so that's what the mitochondria and plastids get. Uh, so what did the proto-eukaryote ancestors get? Well, the mitochondrial, uh, the, the prokaryotes that would become mitochondria provided ATP, and the prokaryotes that would become plastids provided photosynthesis. So, um, very helpful. Now, uh, something to note in here. Um, this proto-eukaryote stuff, uh, I mentioned that all eukaryotes have mitochondria. One thing worth noting, not all eukaryotes have plastids, which means what we have here is a serial event. In other words, we did not have simultaneous uh, absorption of the ancestor that would become mitochondria and the ancestor that would become the plastid. Uh, if they were absorbed at the exact same time, then all eukaryotes would have plastids. So, uh, the mitochondria was our first endosymbiosis event, and then the plastids were later. Um, and that's why only certain uh, branches of eukaryotes are photosynthetic. So, not too bad.
Uh, so this is serial endosymbiosis. Not so terrible. There's some cool stuff. I'm trying to keep time going. So, all right. Talk about basic classification. Um, <clears throat> taxonomy as you know it, most likely. We have three domains of life. We have domain archaea. These are extremophiles. They are a type of prokaryote that is actually fundamentally different from bacteria. Different enough that they get their own domain. And let me tell you, that's a lot of differences. Uh, so they have fundamentally different cell walls than the bacteria. There's a lot of fundamental uh, differences there. They are characterized by often living in extreme environments, uh, hypersaline environments, tons of salt, uh, extreme temperature environments, right? So uh, think of an extreme and there's possibly an archaea that is sitting pretty in there. Then we have domain bacteria, likely what you think of when you think of prokaryotes, right? Both archaea and bacteria are prokaryotes, even though they're very different prokaryotes. And then there's domain eukarya, which is, of course, the eukaryotes. So, um, those are the three fundamental domains. Then we separate our uh, domains into kingdoms. Um, domain bacteria has, amazingly enough, kingdom eubacteria. Uh, if you want to be you know, really, uh, really snooty about it. Add the EU as a prefix and it means true. So, ah, uh, excuse me. These are the true bacteria as opposed to archaea, which is kingdom archaebacteria. which is probably why someone felt the need to you do you bacteria. Uh, okay, then we have four fundamental eukaryote kingdoms. Um, there is the proteasts. However, uh, there is for the people who study proteasts, um, a lot of people would like to break this up into sub kingdoms. There is so much fundamental diversity in proteasts that saying they're all part of like one basic kingdom is kind of uh, an egregious oversimplification, right? Um, there's a lot of diversity. The closest living relative to a fungus is a protease. The closest living relative to a green plant Oh, what do you know? A protease. The closest living relative to an animal. Hmm. Who wants to guess what I'm going to say? That's right. Proteasts. So, and then within protista, there's massive diversity therein. So, uh, it's more than just close living relatives to the other kingdoms. There's a dazzling variety of proteasts. So, uh, thank you for coming to my TED Talk on proteasts. Uh, then we have the fungus among us. Then we have the green plants, planty. Um, green plants is indeed a taxonomical term. So it's a proper taxonomical term. Uh, and then finally, animalia, which is possibly the one you tend to think of when you try and think of a kingdom of eukaryotes. All right. So uh that's the basic kingdom uh, the basic kingdoms now we then break things down grouping them into smaller and smaller categories ostensibly based on how closely related 
these are. So breaking them down into smaller groups of more closely related organisms. So um, it goes kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Uh, so King Philip came over for great spaghetti. Um, so there you go. Not too bad. So amongst kingdom animalia, you have a large variety of phyla. Um, you have periphera, the sponges. You have, uh, you know, arthropoda. Um, you have uh, tons, tons and tons. Rotifera, lots of different kingdoms. Um, so uh, phylums. Chordata includes all of the organisms that have a dorsal nerve cord. Uh, so a nerve cord running along the backside. Uh, if you've ever looked at an insect or a squid um, and you could see their uh, nerve cord running from the head down the body, it runs along the belly side. So um, there's some other stuff to chordata. But uh, having that n dorsal nerve cord fundamentally creates a smaller group of more closely related organisms. Then we have class mammalia. These are organisms with body hair and mammary glands and warm blooded and blah, 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 blah. So uh, all of the organisms that fit those smaller criteria, we exclude reptiles, which includes uh, dinosaurs um, and a bunch. And so, yeah, uh, we, we exclude the reptiles. Um, anyway, then we can go into order carnivora is a group that includes, amazingly enough, carnivores. Uh, this is sort of an odd group. Um, so uh, we kinda, this is sort of an interesting one. Um, it's definitely from the early days of classification, but it's still useful. Um, so order carnivora, carnivores. Not all carnivores, but lots of carnivores. Is it related to a cat? Well, then it's a filiform carnivore. Is it related to a dog? Well, then it's a caniform carnivore. And then other, like the ursiforms, bears and stuff. Okay. Uh, family, Felidae. This is the cats. So, um, genus, Panthera. Uh, and then species, Panthera partis. Uh, so there we go. Tax, uh, the taxonomy of a leopard. Um, not too bad. Uh, <clears throat> Feliform is not a family, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, Felidae includes uh, the cats, but not necessarily all the organisms that are closely related to cats, uh, like hyenas. Hyenas are a feliform carnivore. Ooh, everything's fun. Okay, so uh, how do we identify a species? Binomial nomenclature. Binomial nomenclature goes like this. Genus, species. So, um, indeed, I even made sure to capitalize genus and lowercase species. So when you are writing an organism's scientific name out, the genus will be capitalized. The species will be in lower case, right? The other thing is that it must be in italics. Now, if it is impossible to write it in italics, then you underline it. But uh, outside of handwriting, um, where italics, you know, depending on how you print, could be kind of difficult to uh, differentiate from your normal handwriting, 
Um, you can just select italics on your electronics of choice. So, you know, um, there we go. Uh, so that's the basic format, the genus name and then the specific species name. So remember we had Panthera is the genus and then Pardis is the actual species name. And the full scientific name is Panthera Pardis. And we have some fun other examples. Now, um, how to pronounce scientific names. A lot of scientific names are in Greek or Latin. Um, ancient Greek and Latin are dead languages. Um, there is no one alive who can tell you how to pronounce these words. Uh, the pronunciation is lost to posterity, which means aside from like uh, a few like basic rules that we think we've figured out, if you have two eyes, it sounds like E. Uh, um, so eh. um, anyway, the key to pronouncing any of this stuff is confidence. If you say it very confidently, very confidently, uh, people will assume you know how to say it. Soromalis obesus is the chuckwalla. Myrmacophaga tridactyla. Myrmacophaga? 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 No. Myrmacophaga tridactyla. Look at the expertise. A telerix albaventris. A seros placatus. Mm, nice. Okay, so uh, hypothetically, the Latin names, uh, this, the binomial nomenclature um, gives you a kind of a sort of description. Like they're often named after basic descriptions. Uh, the scientific name of the giant ant eater means eater of ants, myrmecophagia, and tridactyla means three fingers. So, African hedgehog, ineffective fighter with a white belly. I'm not sure who went for that one. Uh, African hedgehogs eat baby vipers. Um, they produce an enzyme in their body that can uh, basically break down viper venom so that uh, they will get knocked over and they'll go into an almost dormant stage while that venom tries to kill them and then that enzyme gets cranked out and they just clear the venom and then, you know, eat the viper that they, you know, got tagged uh, getting a kill shot in. So, but I guess ineffective fighter. Uh, hornbill sharp point with wrinkles. So not too terrible. So this is genus species. Again, always capitalize the genus, always lowercase the species. Um, if you want to know like why basically think genus as a noun, species as an adjective, although that certainly doesn't help me. If you're deep into grammar rules, there you go. Um, and then italicize that if you can italicize it, underline if you cannot. Okay, let's go into alternative ways to um, classify organisms through systematics. In systematics, we create phylogenies, right? So, um, Good old fashioned classification, uh, Linnaean is what we call it, by the way. Um, so uh, Linnaeus was the scientist who came up with this basic classification scheme. Um, and so this is Linnaean classification. Uh, and it's, it's like, Ultimately, it was originally designed based on how closely things look like they should be related. 
Um, and uh, we can use molecular techniques to sort of uh, figure out better how to organize these uh, critters. Um, but one thing that Linnaean classification doesn't do very well is illustrate the evolutionary relationships. It doesn't illustrate common ancestry. Right? If everything in order carnivora is just in order carnivora. Did they share common ancestors? Did one lineage branch to produce another lineage? Linnaean classification tells you none of that. It's, aside from grouping by relatedness, kind of says nothing about evolutionary history. So, phylogenetics. Phylogenetics, I wrote that perfectly. Uh, phylogenetics is a type of classification that takes into account the evolutionary history of organisms. So, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, another cool thing about phylogenetics is that we can build it out. Uh, this is a very relative sort of thing. We can look at the phylogenetic relationships in a single genus. Like we could look at the phylogenetic relationships in genus Homo, which is all of the walking on two legs, bipedal, uh, ancestors of humans, bipedality, bipedal being the big thing that makes you in genus homo. So you could create a map of common ancestry showing all of the members of genus homo. Uh, you could pull that out and look at the apes. You could pull that out further and look at primates pull that out a little further and look at a group that includes primates and their closest relatives even further out. And you look at groups uh, that, you know, are even more distantly related. So you can keep focusing in. You don't even have to have like an entire genus present. You could have several you know, closely related organisms within that genus. Um, so anyway, uh, it's a very cool method of describing the evolutionary relationship of organisms and classifying organisms. Now, uh, one of the things you're going to see in phylogenetics is that we no longer, we use, you know, all the standard order carnivora, family, genus, species, right? Um, we use all of this stuff still. We don't replace Linnaean classification. But there's going to be new terminology. So uh, we'll get into it, but organisms will be grouped into clades. Uh, and this is just going to create new terminology because Linnaean classification was well built out and elegant, uh, and we didn't want to knock the whole thing down and replace it entirely. So instead we create terms for groups of organisms that are related in certain ways, and those will be clades. Uh, so, um, pancrustacea is a clade. It is not in kingdom phylum class, uh, order, family, genus, species. Um, eucrost, eu, uh, pancrustacea is a clade. It includes crustaceans and the organisms that evolved from 
crustaceans, like insects. Uh, all insects are a type of crustacean, which is pretty fun. Uh, butterflies are crustaceans. Woo! Uh, anyway, if it's been a half minute since you've seen the term crustacean, think shrimps, crabs, lobsters, crawdads. Uh, so there's a lot more to it than that. But anyway, uh, pancrustacea is a clade. So um, we don't replace Linnaean, but we're going to use different terminology for this. Okay, so phylogenies. Um, systematics is cool because uh, phylogenies are both great ways to organize organisms based on evolutionary relatedness, but it's also great ways to form hypotheses for evolutionary relationships. In other words, you can build different phylogenetic uh, trees showing different hypothetical relationships between organisms. Um, so you can create different hypotheses, predictions for how these organisms are related. And then you could use things like molecular techniques in order to get a better view of that. Uh, so it uses features uh, that vary among species. So it uses varying characteristics uh, and this is real general but to describe similarities and differences. Um, so, um, these varying characteristics is a very broad term. Uh, you can have morphological What does it look like? What are the structures of its body? Uh, molecular How closely related are the proteins? Like when you look at the hemoglobin differences, mutations in hemoglobin, that sort of thing. Um, chromosomal. These are just examples of uh, varying characteristics that you could use to describe the similarities and differences. How closely related is their hemoglobin could help you organize how closely they are together on the phylogenetic tree. So phylogenetic tree, in case you haven't looked over here, is a branching diagram that shows that evolutionary history. Um, and it shows common ancestry. And it shows most recent common ancestors. Ah, there we go. Most recent common ancestors is an actual term. Um, so uh, you could show how closely related things are by how close you want their common ancestry to be. So um, this is great. Uh, phylogenetics, uh, describing things as a tree showing genetic, well, uh, showing evolutionary relationships because Darwin didn't know what genetics was, but showing evolutionary relationships in a tree was Darwin. Um, and, uh, this was, uh, <clears throat> a very early, uh, common ancestry, uh, tree here. Um, so this is from 1837 right here. So systematics is not particularly new, describing things based on evolutionary relationships. Uh, so decent with modification just simply shows uh, 
evolutionary changes as things branch out from another. So uh, pretty cool. So let's talk about how to read one of these phylogenetic trees. By the way, this phylogenetic tree is pretty cool. Uh, this is showing sort of the way you can create hypothetical relationships uh, with common ancestry. So here we have the most distant common ancestor separating out gibbons. Uh, and then we have a line that goes to orangutans and basically some common ancestor here split off to create the lineage that would produce gorillas and the lineage that would produce chimps and humans. Uh, so that's one way to look at it. Over here, we have simply some primate uh, ancestry. Here's our most distant common ancestor and it splits off showing gibbons and then we go from sort of most primitive to most recent in evolutionary time orangutan then gorillas and then humans and chimps are the most closely related uh and then here's a, another similar tree uh just showing gibbons orangutans and such uh interestingly um, orangutans are significantly more closely related using molecular and chromosomal analysis. Orangutans are much more closely related to gibbons than they are to any of the other great apes. Um, and even though they share very similar adaptations to the other great apes, it's kind of questionable whether we should put them in the great apes because they are so much more closely related to gibbons. Uh, so, fun facts. All right, how to read a phylogenetic tree. So this is a phylogenetic tree. Now let's talk about our terminology that we use for our phylogenetic tree. So, um, anytime we have a branch that shows common ancestors, this is referred to as a node, right? So a branch point, uh, so a common ancestor, well, brr, common ancestor. Let's do that because we get a little pedantic here. So nodes are common ancestors. They're basically the little points just before where we get branches. A node is generally where we find a branch point. So, uh, you know, branch points come from nodes. Um, and they show diverging lineages. So divergence from the common ancestor. So two different lineages diverged from that point. Uh, when we are unsure of the exact, exact phylogenetic relationships. So, for instance, if we show, uh, if we find some organisms that are extremely closely related and our morphological, chromosomal, and molecular analyses don't clearly show them this one, like, so, for instance, here we are at DEF, um, we don't have enough information to show like whether we had E producing D and D producing F or any number of variations, right? Uh, we just don't have enough information to create a clear phylogenetic point. So uh, we have unresolved divergence. Uh, we don't know the exact relationship. Exact 
uh, divergence unknown. And when we have multiple branches uh, where we have an unknown divergence, we create a polytomy. So uh, a polytomy is where we have three plus groups taxa. By the way, um, the term for a uh, an a, a, an endpoint, it could be individual species. Your taxon, like I said, this is all relative. You could be looking at different levels. Uh, so sort of our endpoint, our end grouping points uh, is a taxon. It could be a species. It could be a genus. Heck, it could be orders. Um, it could be clades, right? So uh, it sort of depends on your frame of reference that your tree is built on. So a polytomy has three plus taxa. All right, um, sister taxa right here. These are taxa that share an immediate common ancestor. So uh, taxa that share an immediate common ancestor. Not too bad. Uh, and then whenever you are creating a phylogenetic tree, you always have to have, because this can be at different frames of reference, right? You always have to have what we refer to as a basal taxa. The basal taxon is always present in one of these phylogenetic trees. And it's basically the earliest diverging lineage in your frame of reference. So uh, it is basal because it is going to share the, uh, well, it's going to have the sort of least specifically shared characteristics. Uh, so for instance, um, if you're looking at vertebrates, things with backbones, things with bones, um, the basal taxa in vertebrates is called a hagfish. Uh, it has a cartilage skull, and that's pretty much it when it comes to bones. So there's going to be all sorts of different specialized adaptations when looking at the rest of the organisms, animals with bones, right? Tons of different cool stuff going on with the bones. Jaws, I don't, I don't, I don't, that's an evolutionary development. That would be a thing where we'd put a node because jaws emerge, right? So um, we could use these grouping characteristics, jaws are morphological, uh, to create nodes and diverge our lineages. So, uh, so the hagfish is a basal organism. Uh, so it is sort of the most primitive in evolutionary time in your particular frame of reference. Okay. Uh, all right, let's talk about how we group organisms. Um, so when we are creating phylogenetic trees, when we are creating phylogenies, 
right? We can create different phylogenies. Um, like sort of one of the gold standards there is to create monophyletic groups. A monophyletic group is where uh, you have a taxon and all uh, it's most, re oh, well, let's rephrase that. You have a group that includes taxa sharing one common ancestor. Again, frame of reference matters here. Uh, like, hypothetically, every living thing is monophyletic. Like, if you wanted to create the phylogeny of all life on Earth, it is a monophyletic tree um, because there was the origin of life, right? And all things came from the origin of life, uh, whatever the first organism that appeared. Um, so... Uh, whatever the product of, uh, of, uh, I'm suddenly forgetting the name, uh, abiogenesis. Thank you, brain. So, uh, that original organism that appeared is the common ancestor and all living things are monophyletic. So again, frame of reference, right? So you might have a node here, and then you might have reptiles and mammals. Ah. Yeah, pretend that spells mammals. Uh, so all reptiles are monophyletic. All mammals are monophyletic. And then all of those terrestrial organisms are monophyletic. So you can see how frame of reference matters an awful lot when determining if something's a monophyletic grouping. Now, um, <clears throat> when you are run, doing your analysis, you might look at a paraphyletic grouping. A paraphyletic grouping is when you have a taxon, a group of organisms. So each of these letters could be taxa, individual taxa. And then if you wanted, because frame of reference, this whole grouping here could be one taxon. <laughs> So you could have individual taxons and then group them all into one taxon. Uh, Pancrustacea versus crustacean and insects. Uh, insects are a taxon. Crustaceans are a taxon. Pancrustacea is a taxon that includes those taxa. It's, uh, it's fun. Um, but anyway, you have a taxon that includes... a single common ancestor and some but not all its descendants. So that is a paraphyletic grouping. You're still dealing with a single common ancestor, but you have ignored these two taxa right here. So your taxon is a paraphyletic grouping. Then you have polyphyletic groupings. Uh, so a polyphyletic grouping, right? We have 
we do not include one common ancestor. So, uh, group does uh, group slash taxon not have one common ancestor. Uh, and so we have at least two separate evolutionary origins. So that's polyphyletic. So here, um, this is C and D. And then here is E, F, and G, right? So in this case, our taxon, our frame of reference is just this group and this group. These two groups are monophyletic. C and D are monophyletic. E, F, and G are monophyletic. But... Looking at grouping these together creates a polyphyletic group, right? So you get the idea. Frame of reference is very important. If you try and just, if you try and like think of this as fundamentally different sorts of things, uh, you're going to have trouble. Like, because you'll get yourself confused looking at this and be like, wait, no, this is monophyletic and that's monophyletic. So this is monophyletic, but your frame of reference is two separate evolutionary origins. Uh, and so your groups, your taxa includes two groups that have separate evolutionary origins. So um, always good to remember that everything is monophyletic and then you can make any paraphyletic or polyphyletic grouping you want. Uh, so it's all life is monophyletic. And then you can turn this all into paraphyletic groupings or polyphyletic groupings, depending on how you are analyzing this stuff. So uh, there you go. Um, so for instance, you might go paraphyletic if you are an, uh, analyzing one particular feature, right? So, um, so let's say uh, this is um, bats with sonar. And this is bats that cannot echolocation. Cannot echolocation? Cannot echolocate. Non echolocating bats. Right? So your paraphyletic grouping is the echolocating bats. Sonar is in water, but you know, whatever. But it's all part of a monophyletic grouping that is all of the bats. Right. So um, here you might have like uh, flying organisms. You could make a polyphyletic grouping. Right. So you might have the avian dinosaurs here and the flying mammals, the bats here whatever that spells mammals uh so this is polyphyletic dinosaurs avian dinosaurs had a separate evolutionary history from bats not too terrible uh so archosaurs Boop. this is a monophyletic grouping dinosaurs right? Uh, birds are dinosaurs. This is an old figure. So, uh, but 
if you are just looking at him non avian dinosaurs this is a paraphyletic group right because we have not included the hawks even though they are part of the monophyletic group dinosaurs so by excluding non avian dinosaurs uh, ex essentially this is our extinct dinosaurs um, we have created a paraphyletic group and then amazingly enough there's flying vertebrates polyphyletic Ta -da! okay so uh, you can add uh, you, you can do uh, fun stuff with hypotheses on here with your phylogenetic um, trees. So uh, <clears throat> you can uh, look at the development of larvae uh, in marine snails. Uh, so basically we have the Paleocene from just after the KT event, the uh, meteor and volcanic activity and such that ended the dinosaurs. Paleocene is a period of 10 million years. Uh, and we saw that um, we have marine snails. Uh, when we look in fossil beds showing a lot of larvae, we have non or we have dispersing larvae. Mostly. So this would be the minority is non dispersing larvae. Uh, so we can see there's generally less than 25% of the fossils during the Paleocene are non-dispersing larvae. Most larvae uh, in marine snails are off in the currents. They are part of the plankton uh, carried by the currents. Non-dispersing larvae just settle on the ocean bottom. Uh, and so we can see in the Eocene, we had a sudden increase in non-dispersing larvae to the point where more than 50% by the end of the Eocene are non-dispersing larvae. Not so terrible. Okay, so how could we create phylogenies that propose evolutionary relationships, right? We have seen something in the fossil record. In the fossil record, our marine snails present in the Paleocene were mostly dispersing larvae. There was a, uh, a major minority were the ones that would just... Uh, lay eggs that would settle to the ocean bottom or the larvae would hatch and settle to the ocean bottom. Most of the larvae were in the currents, right? Um, there are characteristics of these larvae that tell us uh, whether or not they're dispersing or non-dispersing. So um, if you want like a shorthand for non-dispersing, the larvae look like miniature versions of the snail. So uh, dispersing larvae will look like weird because they have all sorts of little adaptations to help them uh, float and catch current. Anyway, getting too far into it. So we have a pattern. In the Paleocene, non-dispersing larvae are the minority. And then throughout the Eocene, we get an increase in non-dispersing larvae. So why why? Our scientific question is, why do we see an increase in non-dispersing larvae? And we could look at the evolution of non-dispersal 
through phylogenetics and create competing hypothetical phylogenetic trees that might explain the sudden resurgence, or not resurgence, but the sudden increase in non-dispersal in the fossil record. Okay, so uh, here's some phylogenetic trees. So uh, in this phylogenetic tree, uh, it's kind of cut off a little bit, but we have a bunch of convergent evolution. So in brown, right, this is non-dispersing. Here's non-dispersing. Here's non-dispersing. Boom. Boom. So uh, multiple different marine snail uh, clades evolve non-dispersing larvae independently of another of one another and indeed we can see occasionally we have a secondary loss of non-dispersal so if we consider non-dispersal a new characteristic from which to branch it losing that characteristic to create a new branch would be called a secondary loss some fun evolutionary terminology here. Uh, but the big deal here is we have convergent evolution in multiple points, different marine snail uh, lineages have developed non-dispersing larvae. The competing hypothesis would be uh, non-convergence, whereas we have a couple of nodes and then all of our non-dispersing larvae share that most recent common ancestor. And so all of our non-dispersing larvae are sort of um, like all of these ones are a monophyletic group. These are a monophyletic group, right? So uh, they all share a development point. In other words, we don't have convergence producing a bunch of different disparate lineages. So these are competing hypotheses. One showing convergence from uh, disparate lineages. And this showing mostly uh, developing from one node, right? Here's one node that produces this large group of non-dispersals, and here's one node that produces the other large group of non-dispersing organisms. So when we look using molecular techniques, using fossil techniques, modern molecular techniques, uh, and, you know, all of that, we find, boop, 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 multiple disparate lineages independently evolving non-dispersing larvae. And then these lineages in the Eocene must have had some kind of competitive advantage that allowed them to proliferate. So we can see that hypothesis A is supported by the data. Hypothesis B is not supported by the data. So that's how we can create some fun hypotheses using systematics. All right, I got 10 minutes left. Uh, 13 of 19. I'm going to get pretty close to done with this one. Okay, so let's make more hypotheses. Uh, so um, we can predict features of extinct groups based on fe features of extant groups. Extinct means what you probably know. Uh died out, gone permanently.
died out. Extant, you might not be aware of. Alive today. Okay, so um, we can create a phylogenetic tree and here's a node and our node includes the archosaurs. And we want to predict features of the non-avian dinosaurs. So the non avian dinosaurs. We've got a problem. The non-avian dinosaurs are all extinct, right? There's no such thing as a living non-avian dinosaur. The only living dinosaurs are the avian dinosaurs. Uh, but the phylogenetic grouping archosaurs includes the basal taxon of crocodilians. Now, a basal taxon can often be used as a predictor of shared characteristics. What that basal group has will probably be present in all groups that came later. So this is one of the reasons why a basal taxon is always so important because it can be used for comparison. It can be used to describe, uh, you know, notable characteristics that everything else in your phylogenetic tree shares. Uh, so, um, and then the branch, like the branching points show novel new characteristics that appeared to create a branching lineage. So, because, because we know that avian dinosaurs are dinosaurs, and we know that crocodilians are basal in the archosaurs, we can predict some basic features, right? So, first of all, all avian dinosaurs and crocodilians exhibit nesting behavior. So, based on the phylogenetic tree alone, we could predict that the non-avian dinosaurs exhibit some kind of nesting behavior. And indeed, when we look at fossils, we can find uh, fossil beds where we had large nesting groups. Um, poor Oviraptor got a bad rap. Uh, the scientific name Oviraptor means egg thief because they found a, uh, you know, a critter with nasty looking claws uh, with some eggs. And they were like, ah, this thing was yoinking uh, eggs from other dinosaurs to eat them, obviously. Uh, and indeed, when we look at modern analyses of the oviraptor beds, uh, these were all nesting oviraptors. Um, so whoever came up with that was a jerk. Poor oviraptors, man. Their scientific name, forever an insult to what they were actually doing when they all died and got fossilized. Okay, anyway, um, so nesting behavior. This can include protecting the nest, making the nest, and incubating the nest. This being more common in the avian dinosaurs than the crocodilians, but still, uh, pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> other things that we could predict in the archosaurs for chambered hearts. Right? 
Um, so, nesting behavior, building, brooding. Uh, oh, some kind of parental care may be present. Uh, crocodilians tend to show parental care. I am not offhand aware of a crocodilian that doesn't show some initial parental care uh, and can include things like gathering them from the nest, excavating the nest and gathering them and taking them to uh, a good hiding spot in the water. And then it can also include using their mouth as a home base when they're very early on in the water. So oftentimes while they're still absorbing their yolk, they'll hang around their parent. Uh, so it, parental care doesn't go all that long after that, but, uh, and then you have more complicated parental care in the avian dinosaurs. So some degree of parental care. Uh, pretty cool. Uh, so four chambered hearts, crocodilians and avian dinosaurs have four chambered hearts. Uh, avian dinosaurs are warm blooded. Uh, crocodilians, uh, are not specifically endothermic. Uh, there we go. Um, and then crocodilians and avian dinosaurs do some form of singing. So, Crocodilians have a very different type of song uh, and often involves um, like extreme low frequency rumbles uh, and vibrating in the water. Um, but that is some type of singing. And then the avian dinosaurs, a little more complicated. But from those, uh, from the fact that it's in the basal and the avians, and this is a monophyletic group, uh, we could make predictions about these things and then look at the fossil record and see that we see nests, we see uh, or uh, dinosaurs that died on their nest, indicating that they were doing some kind of brooding slash incubating slash protection. So uh, we can see in some of these very large groups that there was... Uh, various ages of dinosaurs in a herd. Um, so, uh, you know, there could be some kind of parental care going on there. Uh, boop. Um, that one, two, three, four uh, on the slide, one, four chambered heart, two, sing, three, build nests, four, exhibit brooding, uh, in case you were wondering, but I, I did that, I think, in a better way. Okay, continuing on through cladistics. So, I have said clade briefly. Uh, so, a clade is a monophyletic group. Again, this is something that can have different frames of reference, right? Clades can be very small groupings of organisms and it can be large groupings of more distantly related organisms, but it is always monophyletic. A clade by definition is a monophyletic group, right? Uh, so what else is a clade? Um, it is similarities from because it's monophyletic we are looking at similarities amongst species that share uh, that are inherited from the most recent common ancestor. Uh, so, in other words, 
We are looking at inherited characteristics to create our clades. Uh, a clade is always monophyletic. A clade, uh, so when we create a clade, if we create a tree, a phylogenetic tree of clades, specifically clades, then there will always be an outgroup. Always. You have to have an outgroup. Outgroup uh, is similar to a basal taxon. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> the key to an outgroup, right, it is uh, the most closely related group that does not share the specific characteristics, the specific inherited characteristics you're looking at. The inherited characters in question. Right, because again, outgroup can vary based on what exactly you're looking at. Right, so, um, all right. Let's talk about characteristics and terminology for characteristics. So we're looking at inherited characteristics, shared inherited characteristics, shared inherited characteristics. And when we create these little characteristics um, that separate out a lineage, uh, we refer to them as derived characteristics. A derived characteristic is a character shared by all subsequent clades. All the rest of the clades have that character. I'm over 75 minutes. I'm just going to finish this slide. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so that's a shared derived characteristic. Uh, so um, let's talk about how we can classify some of these characteristics. An ancestral characteristic. An ancestral characteristic, right, is a character that is in both the outgroup and the clades, right? So ancestral characters are present in outgroup and the rest of the cladogram. That is an ancestral character. So this cladogram down here is of uh, chordata. Uh, so you remember I mentioned dorsal nerve cord? That is present in amphioxus. And it is, of course, present in everything else in the, in the clades that you're actually looking at. So again, the outgroup is kind of your most primitive one that we can use in our organizational scheme. Um, and then you are looking at clades beyond the outgroup to do your actual analysis of relationships. So, um, and again, you could easily then construct a clade that includes amphioxus, right? And then you would need a new outgroup if you did that. So, uh, there you go. Um, you can start to see how this works. Okay, so 
Next up, a plesiomorphy. A plesiomorphy is the ancestral state. In other words, it's often your outgroup. Your outgroup will often have sub the the basic uh, the basic ancestral characteristics. Um, and so, when you see morph, think structure or appearance. So the ancestral characteristics are the characteristics in the outgroup. The plesiomorphy is the physical state what it looks like essentially so okay now let's go on into the derived stuff all right as i mentioned a shared derived characteristic is a characteristic that appears and splits off a group. So the amphioxus is our little, there's more to it, but let's just say dorsal nerve cord is present here. Uh, there's no bones in amphioxus. Uh, this is amphioxus. Um, and that little amphioxus is the synapomorphic state. Uh, or plesiomorphic state, the plesiomorphic state, right? There you go. Uh, so, bleh. there's a dorsal nerve cord, there's gills, uh, there's an anus, and then a tail after it, so a postanal tail, and then there's a flexible tube that's separate from the dorsal nerve cord called a notochord. Those are the four uh, ancestral characteristics for this particular cladogram present. All right. So then we have to separate our outgroup from the clades that we're looking at the presence of vertebra and jaws. So these are our first shared derived characteristics. Everything coming after in this monophyletic group will have vertebra and jaws. What those shared derived characteristics are depends on what the cladogram is you're trying to make. So there you go. Uh, now, that takes care of derived. It means that uh, a derived character it appears and everything after um, has it, right? Lizards are derived from that organism that had vertebra and jaws, All right? So, because we gotta have all this fun terminology, Synapomorphy is a shared derived characteristic. So if you wanted to use plesiomorphy more correctly, you would say a notochord is a plesiomorphic character. Gill uh, slits are a plesiomorphic character. The postanal tail is a plesiomorphic character. It is a plesiomorphy. These are characters present in the ancestral group, the outgroup. So, um, more of an adjective than anything else. So, a synapomorphy means it is a shared derived characteristic used to create our multiple clades within our cladogram. Uh, so, um, indeed, groups that share a synapomorphy are a clade. 
So that is the official definition of a clade. Groups sharing synapomorphies. Cladograms are then nested hierarchies. They're the little Russian nesting dolls, right? What has vertebra and jaws? Bass, lizards, horse and horses and monkeys, right? Okay, so now let's separate this uh, with the terrestrial organisms that are fully terrestrial. They don't have to, they're not required to spend time in water. Well, what do those have? They have four legs and amniotic eggs. So um, we've now kicked bass out and we're now a smaller nested group, lizards, horses, and monkeys, right? Um, amniotic egg is an egg with multiple membranes. We'll talk about it later. Then hair and mammary glands gets us away, like kicks lizards out of this particular clade that includes horses and monkeys. Um, and then you could uh, have like, I don't know, thumbs. And you've separated horses and monkeys. Ta-da! Uh, so, as you can see, again, this is one of those things where we can zoom out and zoom in almost infinitely, right? We're depending on what exactly we're trying to reference. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> this is just an example of how we'd make our cladogram. Again, uh, we must have our ancestral versus derived characteristics. So, we have to have our ancestral characteristics uh, to create our outgroup, the plesiomorphies, uh, plesiomorphies. And then we have to have our synapomorphies, our shared derived characteristics, right? And so basically when you construct a clade, you just pick, you, you can, like I said, zoom in, zoom out, right? And you just Pick what your outgroup is going to be, then define the plesiomorphies of that outgroup, and then start creating the synapomorphies that separate your clades. Ta da! So, a vertebral column separates, so our outgroup is the lancelet. Here we have the lamprey. Uh, the lamprey is a very primitive uh, chordate, or not chordate, but it's a very primitive vertebrate. It has no jaws. It has a cartilaginous head. Uh, it still has a notochord in addition to some cartilaginous bones in there. Um, so it's very primitive. But the lancelet is our outgroup. So this is still part of our shared derived characteristics. It has, however primitive, a vertebral column. Right? Then jaws. As I mentioned, no jaws, so jaws, and everything after has jaws. Four walking legs. Well, there's our first terrestrial vertebrates, the frogs, amphibians, and then amniotic membranes to the egg, which gets us let, uh, reptiles and mammals, and then hair. So each of these is a synapomorphy that separates out your clades. It's not too terrible. It really isn't. Shoot, I am so close to done. Okay, so question. Does the length of the branches in our cladogram matter? Does it matter? And the answer to that is a 
clear and resolute sometimes. So, um, branch lengths can, one, not matter at all. So, there is no relationship between branch lengths and, you know, the clades. Uh, so, you could have no particular relationship. Two, you could have branch lengths represent the amount of genetic differences, genetic changes. So, amount of genetic change. And that would be this one here. Uh, humans and mice are much more closely related genetically than they are to chickens. So, the branches here, the length before we get our node that separates humans and mice is very short compared to how far back we have to go in order to get to the node that separates humans from chickens compared to the node that separates uh, humans from frogs, humans from zebrafish, humans from lancelets, humans from crustaceans. Fruit flies. Insects or crustaceans. Uh, and then three, your branch lengths could indicate time. In other words, appearance in the fossil record. So, when did they appear? Drosophila, you can go back before the Paleozoic to find uh, fossil evidence of flies. Uh, then around 542 million years ago is when we get our lancelets. And then around whatever that is, 300-ish, uh, you have the appearance of jawed fishes. Uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah, frogs and... So, we can see with time on here, we can also infer some genetic relationships as well. Uh, so, however, it is worth noting uh, a, a cladogram that has time does not necessarily indicate genetic relationships, right? You could have things that are very closely related but that appeared very far back in the fossil record, right? You could have crocodilians appearing way the hell back here, and then you have all these branches and all these branches and then more branches, and then you get the avian dinosaurs. And the avian dinosaurs are much closer to the present than the appearance of crocodilians, but they are very closely related because they're all archosaurs, uh, a monophyletic grouping. Clade archosauria. Mm, mm, getting it? Okay. So, uh, let's talk about the, uh, when constructing clades and looking at possible relationships, the principle of maximum parsimony. In other words, uh, the less complicated it is, in general, the more likely it is to be correct. Uh, mm, mm, mm. But uh, removing uh, assumptions and creating logical groupings is probably the best way to go about this. So the principle of maximum parsimony is... The tree in cladistics, cladistics, because parsimony is important all over the place. Uh, so in cladistics, the tree with the fewest, and, and again, hypothetical, the hypothetical tree with the fewest common ancestors
Uh, or if we're talking about trees that show genetic relatedness, right, requires the fewest uh, gene genetic changes So maybe if you're building a cladogram that takes into account genetic relatedness, the tree that requires the fewest genetic changes, but the tree with the fewest common ancestors is most likely to be correct. And again, this is a probability thing, basically creating fewer uh, potential like changes required. So for instance, if we look at uh, genetic relatedness, humans, um, <clears throat> the genetic uh, differences between humans and mushrooms is a combined 30%. Uh, so, um, they basically have 15% genetic differences and then between humans and plants, the genetic differences should sum to 40%. So you have a node and you're going to have plants and you're going to have humans and it has to sum to 40%. So 20%. 20%. And then humans and mushrooms, we're going to have our node and it has to sum to 15 or 30%. So 15%, 15%. And then to create a maximum parsimony tree, uh, since we have fewer genetic differences between human and mushrooms, we would assume that they are more closely related. So we'd give them a node, a shared node, uh, and boop, boop. And then because there's more genetic differences between humans and tulips, we'd consider them to be less related. And when we look at mushrooms and tulips, we find also a 40% difference. So when we look at humans, the sum going back to our node has to be 20% because the branch leading to our tulip is also 20%, which sums to 40. And the branch leading from the mushroom also has to sum to 20%. So being that humans and mushrooms are less different than humans and tulips and mushrooms and tulips, we create a tree in which they are closer together. They share a more recent common ancestor, and we go back further to get the node that gives us tulips. We can compare this to a tree that is less parsimonious. So here um, we have a node showing a fundamental division of mushrooms, the fungus, away from both humans and tulips. In order for this to work, uh, we have a 5% difference from the common ancestor here, and then a 10% difference to this node, which then gives us another 15% difference to humans, 15, 25, 30. And then 15 uh, and 25 here gets us 40% to the tulips and five, uh, percent, ten percent, twenty-five percent gets us forty percent to the mushrooms. But again, this represents a very odd hypothetical tree, because in general, the fewer genetic changes, the more related they are. This tree separates out some nodes, and this tree shows humans and tulips having a more recent common ancestor than humans and mushrooms, 
despite humans and mushrooms sharing uh, more genetic uh, changes. So um, think of it like Occam's razor. But for uh, cladistics, Occam's razor is the simplest solution is most likely to be the correct one. Most likely heavy lifting here, folks. This is probabilistics, right? You can't just create a maximum parsimony tree and call it good. You then have to, because a, a maximum parsimony tree is still a hypothetical tree. It is a cladogram that demonstrates hypothetical relationships. And so you then have to collect evidence. Boop, problems with cladistics. Uh, monophyletic groupings don't always make sense, right? So uh, how we group species is not always monophyletic for one. Um, so, again, um, <clears throat> we have the great apes, uh, and that includes Pongo, gorillas, and chimpanzees, slash bonobos. Um, and Pongo here, right? are significantly more closely related to hylobates than they are to gorillas or chimpanzees. So orangutans are significantly more closely related to the hylobates. Uh, so we looked at this uh, previously right over... Ba -ba 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 -ba. Which one was it? Here. Gibbons and orangutans. So it is very clear when you put this. So this is just a phylogeny. When you create a phylogeny with molecular techniques and fossil uh, time, um, hylobates and pongo will be more like this. So you'll have a common ancestor and then you'll have gorillas, pan, and hominidae, right? So uh, this pongidae is a clade, but it's not monophyletic. So once upon a time, Hypothetically, it was a monophyletic clade, right? Orangutans sure look an awful lot like gorilla and pan, right? Uh, so it made a lot of sense to put orangutans in Pongidae. Uh, but they are not particularly closely related to gorillas and chimpanzees. They're far more closely related to the hylobates. So should they actually be in hylobatidae? So the current, the current clade of hylobatidae and pongidae is sucky because it violates the monophyletic rule. So pongidae is not monophyletic. So species groupings and these species groupings are a lot of baggage from Linnaeus. Because good old Linnaean classification, uh, King Philip came over for great spaghetti, um, was based on like you're talking the 17th century, these people were just like, yeah, those two things look alike, so they're closely related. So species groupings are not always monophyletic. Uh, you know what's a term that once uh, was considered a clade but has been lost? Pachyderm.
pachyderm was a term for the clade of large African mammals, elephants, rhinoceroses, hippopotamuses, right? So when you wanted to go look at those things, you went to the pachyderm house at the zoo. Pachyderm is a dead term. It turns out that clade was absolutely not monophyletic. Um, there was, you could not group the African megafauna mammals. Megafauna, by the way, just means huge uh, living thing, huge non-plant. Uh, so um, anyway, you could absolutely could not group them all into one clade, uh, one monophyletic clade, without including a whole bunch of other stuff that we generally did not consider a pachyderm. Right, so that was the big problem. Hypothetically, you could create a monophyletic clade uh, with elephants, rhinoceroses, hippos, and such. But, you know, and if you wanted to call that pachyderm, great. But pachyderm now includes whales. <laughs> because if you're making a monophyletic group that includes elephants and hippos, it's going to have whales. So uh, that's a problem with clades. Sometimes how we group an animal just doesn't work. Um, so uh, there's, there's a stain power to old Linnaean classification that's really fascinating. Uh, this is sort of like a philosophical thing, but... Um, there's like a real stain power to the way we classified things through Linnaean classification. And we often try to, like, we try not to abandon Linnaean groups, which is fascinating because science is in general self-correcting. Um, we really should, and I bet you anything, I could find the clade that, that has uh, gibbons and orangutans separate from gorillas and chimpanzees. Um, so there you go. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, <clears throat> Pongidae as a group, also paraphyletic because a monophyletic clade includes a common ancestor and all of the derived species. So Pongidae is an odd clade. It technically violates the rules of cladistics because, right, A, orangutans and gibbons share a much more recent common ancestor than gorillas and chimps, so it doesn't really make sense to put them in Pongidae. And B, it's, uh, not great as a uh, primate group because it's paraphyletic. We're ignoring humans. <coughs> so, and if we're including orangutans, then Pongidae, if it were monophyletic, should probably also include gibbons. So, look at all this super logical scribbling right here. Make sure, make sure you write all that down. Um, just circle things everywhere. Okay, so problems uh, when we create these groups. Convergence and homology versus analogy. Okay, so um, we can mistake. So one of the problems is mistaking convergence for synapomorphies. So remember, a synapomorphy is something shared by everything after. So if you're trying to create a synapomorphy um, and you have convergence, you might be tempted to include those features as a synapomorphy. 
uh, when in reality, convergence would likely be uh, on the little branch leading to the particular clade or taxon. Uh, so you'd have to separate convergence out, convergent characters out. So mistaking convergence for synapomorphies is a potential problem. And uh, homologous structures versus analogous structures. Homologous structures, who remembers, is structures with different functions but share uh, features due to common ancestor, ancestry. So bones in forearms, a radius and an ulna present in a wide variety of organisms. So these are homologous structures, analogous structures. Similar function, uh, but not uh, derived from a common ancestor. And so uh, you could have, um, yeah, so uh, homologous structures, great. These can be used as synapomorphies. Analogous structures, no. Convergent evolution. Um, often analogous structures. Often analogous structures. So there you go. Uh, da, 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 da. Ta -da! That's the end of the lecture. Um, it went over. I apologize, but oh, I was so close. But Oh, I went like 35 minutes over. So I wasn't actually close in time. I was close in slide count. Apologies. Uh, yeah. Um, good night. I love you. It's 2 a.m.